It is 7 p.m. and that can only mean one thing from every other Thursday. I'll be joining all of you here on Unite Radio for this brand new show founded today called Their Football Life. But let's, before we start, what does it actually mean? What will we be discussing? What will we be talking about? Will there be interviews on here? Well, this will be a show where I'll be talking about Europa League, FA Cup, Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal. But, and I think more importantly, I would like to talk about those top leagues, but I'd like to also talk about the leagues that don't get spoken about as much. You know, you could dive into Ukraine, Portugal, any country in the world. It's all about sharing nationalities and division and really building here as a community. Right, let's begin. Manchester City face Brighton at the Amex Stadium tonight. Brighton, where do we begin with Brighton and Hove Albion? They've struggled in recent times. They've only got 13 points from a possible 42. 42 points. You know, we've been talking about Brighton recently and saying that they could be one of the best teams in Europe at recent times. However, a bit of a drop-off for them, 13 points. But what I think's been the difference in Brighton's praises and negativity this season has probably been their injuries. I mean, we've seen Evan Ferguson, Gilmore, Mitoma, and CISO, James Milner. These are really good experienced players that have been in Brighton's team for over a few years now. And they've just been struggling with injuries, some with suspensions. And Manchester City, I do think, will struggle tonight at the Amex Stadium from 8pm. So look, you can listen, 7 till 8pm on United Radio, then straight over to the Amex for a really great game. So I think it'll be a good game. I think Brighton could even take the lead early on. You never, ever know. Another thing that I want to talk about is De Zerbi, the Brighton manager. You know, he's come from, uh, you know, a weird place. I mean, he came from Shakhtar in Ukraine. And then obviously, when Russia invaded Ukraine, he thought that it would be best for him to leave. Took a few backroom staff with him. Ended up at Brighton. He's now being linked with Liverpool's job, with Real Madrid's job, AC Milan's job. A lot of talk about him returning back to Italy. But Liverpool's been the big one, with Klopp stating that he's ran out of energy um, in the last few years. And well, we'll talk about that later, because I think that that might not be the case. Although we have seen it in recent weeks, I think that Klopp is leaving due to other reasons behind the scenes. However, De Zerbi has come out and he said that I have a contract here about, you know, trying to bland the talks of him leaving. And for me... That is a big statement to make. However, we would all expect him, if you know about football, you'd expect him to make this kind of statement. He's not going to come out and say, I'm joining Liverpool, I'm joining AC Milan, I'm joining this team. However, 13 points from 42 games. Would you really want a manager who's got Brighton so far to now knock out the Europa League, knocked out all the Cups, and now only got 13 points out of 42 this calendar year? We've spoken about injuries. But now, with top teams, where they want to fight for the top six and then move into the top four, because it's all about building up progression and and, um, working on the season, on the previous seasons. You know, they had Graham Potter before. Everyone thought he was a great manager. And when he left to go to join Chelsea, everyone thought, you know, could De Zerbi do it? Is it just Brighton? It is kind of just Brighton because Brighton have been playing really, really well regardless of their manager. However, Matoma hasn't really been the player that we've seen in recent months and years. Uh, sorry, in recent years. In recent months, he's been quite an upset for a few Brighton fans, I'd say. Ferguson as well. He's been hitting a lot of headlines. He's been the target man up front. Injuries, though. Just a bit too injury prone for players and managers around him. Gilmore. You know, he went on loan to Norwich from Chelsea. A player that, you know, was on the frisk of being a Chelsea starter. Gone and taken possibly a backward step. I mean, not this season, but, you know, on paper, a backward step in joining Brighton. Been a really class midfielder, and I really think he's going to do well. If he continues to stay in this Brighton team under a good setup, regardless of the manager, you've got Scotland calling. You've got a really great midfielder in there, a CDM, a centre mid. Could even push up to Cam at times, but he's a really good, solid player to have in your team, and is really good going forward. Now, we can base this off Watford, or we could base it off Brighton and Hove Albion. We could say both here. You know, they like to go for the unknown. They like to try and target South American wonder kids, or African players that could be coming from anywhere in the lesser regions you know why you get them for cheap you can do them up you can make them you can mold them into your player hopefully they score a few goals or keep some clean sheets regardless of position and then you'd sell them to a big club Chelsea Manchester United clubs that are willing to pay the high buck and get these players away from Brighton or Watford because this is a strategy that some clubs like to impose or some clubs are at, the, are at the top for a reason because they like to keep those players because they're an attractive club. But with Brighton, who were kind of flirting with the top six, top seven, possibly even could be going for Conference League and I'm sure they'd still be happy with that. 
It's been a difficult time for Brighton, nonetheless. And then Ciso, who is injured for tonight against Manchester City, which will be a big loss for him. The Paraguayan. You don't really see a lot of major Paraguayans. You see Almiron. That's probably the only Paraguayan I can name alongside in Ciso. And I do think he is he's a great creative player. He's young. But Brighton's strategy, will he be going in the next few years? I think he might. You can let me know on Instagram at jamie.mccready. Sound is a bit weird to, to spell for some people. It's M-C-C-R-E-E-D-Y. And you can tell me everything, your opinion, and I'll be sure to get you on, not next week, but the week after. And talking about next week, there's some great shows coming up. Not today. Some next shows coming up Thursday, Friday. There's a whole host of shows. So Unite Radio is your place to be. Manchester City, let's talk about them as they travel to the Amex tonight. Pep Guardiola being the complainer that he is. We could all argue from all different perspectives. You know, Arteta's a complainer. Klopp's a complainer. Pep's a complainer. But Pep was stating last week, uh, after the after their team went to the wire in extra time versus Chelsea and won one nil, he was saying that he's upset that his team had played on Wednesday and then they're playing on Saturday and now they're playing tonight. But Pep, you know, if I'm having a conversation with Pep, let's be real, Pep, you've got all this money to spend, a billion pound squad, a ridiculous over a billion pounds. You've got such a great squad. You know, there's even talk to your second team going really far in the Premier League could even go ahead and win it. And, you know, to complain to play against these FA Cup games or the Champions League games, I think he's a bit of a sore loser. Because if he won against Real Madrid, I think it would be a bit of a different outcast. And he was complaining that Coventry, United and Chelsea, the remaining teams in the FA Cup, um, were didn't play in midweek. Hence why they can have an advantage to win. I think it's my games. I get where he's coming from. But you've had ample ample time to rest your team. And if it's that big of a deal, Pep... Don't play them versus Manchester City, but you'd like to play them because you'd like to go far in the competition. So don't complain. You see Brighton, smaller clubs with less budgets, less wage budgets, less time and effort. You know, you, these clubs have to be doing well. Otherwise, before you know it, because you know what the gap's like, you know, from 15th to, to 9th, there's, there can only be a few points at certain points of the season. And you know, this is where for clubs like Brighton, they do struggle. They got rid of McAllister. They've got a great holding midfielder, like I've stated, in uh, Billy Gilmore. However, Manchester City are not the team to be complaining. And also, 115 charges of FFP, financial fair play, for those who don't know. I'm not the biggest... Um, person to be talking to this about but what I know is clubs need to spend what they're earning so they can spend a certain amount over and go into debt but they can't be spending a ridiculous amount over and that's percentages that's figures and this isn't a math show however we need to talk about 115 charges against the great or supposedly great Manchester City I mean do you think that they're that great I mean, if Liverpool had 115 charges and all this money that they spent when they haven't actually earned the right to use it, okay, fair play. Phil Foden's come through the ranks. Rico Lewis has come through the ranks. But when you're buying all these players, it's not exactly time to be complaining, Pep, when you've got a title charge in your hands. And also, we'll be talking a whole host of title talk later on today. As I spoke about, Manchester City are through to the FA Cup final with a 1-0 win over Chelsea. We waited over 100 years to see a Manchester derby, Manchester City versus Manchester United at Wembley to get the crown of the FA Cup, the most prestigious tournament in England. A tournament that's happened for hundreds and hundreds of years. A club with so much history. Now we've got two in the space of two years. I mean, how on earth has Eric Ten Hag A, managed to keep his job, but also managed to get to two FA Cup finals? And I believe if he wins this FA Cup, he'll be the only manager to win, I think, is it two or three trophies within the first two or three years of the manager's reign? Which is quite something, considering they're always slandering Eric Ten Hag for this decision or this decision. But you weren't winning trophies under really any previous managers apart from Jose Mourinho. You've had a bit of a stinker recently if you really want to talk about the gigs, the Ronaldo. The, the Paul Scholes, all these wonderful players that played for Manchester United. You know, so now, you know, make, make, you have taken a backward step. I mean, you've got Harry Maguire playing at the back. That is a backward step from Rio Ferdinand, for example. But however, you're still winning cups. And I would not be complaining from a perspective of any fan in the Premier League that's not in the top four, who are not challenging really for these major trophies. Crystal Palace would love to get to back-to-back -back FA Cup finals. So, you know, I think maybe they should put a bit more respect on Eric Ten Hag's name. As I spoke about, uh, Manchester City were knocked out by Real Madrid 3-4 on penalties in the Santiago Bernabeu uh, after a 1-1 draw. They took an extra time and then obviously penalties, which they went on to go and lose. A really bizarre, 
a really bizarre penalty kick um, from Bernardo Silva, a player with so much technique and reliability on his shoulders. And he, I think he kind of fluffed their lines. I mean, I don't want to blame any players for getting knocked out because overall you could blame that penalty kick miss, but you could also blame the other chances that Manchester City had in the game. However, it was a really great tie. You know, no, both teams can't go through. That's a final in itself. I think Real Madrid are now massively favourites to go through. I think City were favourites to win uh, and go through versus Madrid, but now you have to say Madrid will be favourites to beat the likes of, what is it, PSG, Bayern and Dortmund. I mean, these teams are great teams, but are they good enough to beat Real Madrid? Jude Bellingham, Rodrigo, Vinicius Jr., you know, Thibaut Courtois, Rudiger. These great players aren't comparable to, firstly, Borussia Dortmund's team, Bayern Munich's team, but this is where it gets interesting because the final... Mbappe versus Vinicius. Bellingham versus Mbappe as well. You know, a really great thing. However, Mbappe, if they get to the final, has all of that weight on his shoulders. He's going to Madrid probably in the summer and he would like to leave on a high. I mean, I would have thought. He would like to have obviously get his hands on a Champions League. He's getting a bit older. Um, he still hasn't really won a major European trophy. None, actually. He's only won um, domestic uh, cups and competitions. However, I think with Mbappe... It's all eyes on him. I mean, you know, he's done so well. Even a nutmeg goal yesterday. I mean, assist, sorry. He's really, really doing great in Paris. It'd be good to see him on the big stage, but I think I'd rather much have him in the Premier League, regardless if it was Manchester City with 115 charges, Arsenal, or even Liverpool. Because I think he'd be a really great addition to the Premier League in, in terms of, you know, bringing in money for shirts, but also a great player. Because there's always been a question as to whether he would be able to do it in the Premier League. And, you know... Would you say that the Spanish league is comparable to the Premier League? Probably not. Manchester City, if they win versus Brighton and Hove Albion tonight, they go second. I mean, that's not bad. But also, they're two points ahead of, uh, of Liverpool and they've one point behind Arsenal with a game in hand. And this is where I've got a problem. Because we can scrap all of these charges aside, 115 away from Manchester City. And this isn't me being salty or, or biased towards Liverpool. However, I must admit, Arsenal are probably the most annoying club in the Premier League. I mean, it's a statement, don't get me wrong. However, you know, I think Arteta has done a really good job. However, is he making the recruitment deals? Is he the one getting Odegaard or Martinelli? No, he's not the one going out to South America to find Martinelli. I think he's done a great job with the team he's had. However, he has, in a way, bottled the league many, many times. He did it last year. He was in the race for, I believe, the year before. And I think the year before that... They were, um, you know, they were ahead of Tottenham for a long, long time in the race for top four to get Champions League back at the Emirates Stadium. And then they lost it to Tottenham. They lost in the North London derby, which is coming up this weekend. And let's talk about that. A really, really big game. And I think for a lot of Tottenham fans, they, they might be getting a bit sick of Ange Postacoglu. And I'm starting to feel that myself, where some fans are coming to me telling me, you know, it's boring Ange's style of football. We're not getting the results. Because ultimately, it doesn't matter what style of football you play, as long as you're getting the points. What I always see with Tottenham, regardless of the manager, they have a really great start to the season, which we saw under Ange. And there was no slow start whatsoever. But if you look at the previous five managers that have been at Tottenham Hotspur, you know, we've seen some really great managers. Conte, Nuno Espirito Santo, a controversial one. Pochettino, the only manager to get more points per game in their first 32 is the main man, Antonio Conte. And he was brought into Tottenham to make an immediate impact. With Ange, it's very different. He's with a process. He had to get rid of Harry Kane, a really, obviously, I don't need to say it, a really good player that can get a lot of goals in a lot of the seasons that he's been at the club. Obviously, he went to Germany to maybe win a trophy. Hasn't quite happened. Still in the Champions League. Would they be able to win that? Maybe, maybe not. However, when we look at this North London derby this weekend... We're going to put Arsenal as the favourites, but I really wouldn't write off Tottenham. It's at their stadium. It's in front of a lot, a lot of, of, of fans that are expecting to, to possibly get even a point out of this game. It really helped the title race had Liverpool not lost to Everton yesterday. But because they lost, even a draw, Arsenal would take with both hands. Because even though Manchester City would be ahead of them, a draw is better than a loss. So I think Arsenal going to the game, wanting to win, going to win, and Tottenham going to the game, because I think they'd be happy with a draw as well. If I think both sides would be modest with a draw. Both sides obviously want to win. It's a derby. But regardless of the derby, I do think that Arsenal would win. Derby situation, it could be a 3-0. But because it's a derby, 
I'm going to just say Tottenham are going to turn it up a notch and they could go for a 2-2 draw. Arsenal, I think, are going to score first. It's going to be a quick start that we've seen under Mikel Arteta in recent years. But yeah, with Arsenal, what we've seen, we've seen we've got they've gone from David Luiz and Mustafi at the back to now having one of the best partnerships at centre-back in the world from Saliba and Gabriel. Two really great players. And there's always been a bit of controversy around Gabriel, where we saw where Arsenal weren't as great two or three years ago. Understandably, they didn't have the great squad and um, the ripeness of this, of this group that they've got. However, what I see with Arsenal is a really, really promising team. They're a really young team. They're going to push on. They can only really get better. And with Mikel Arteta in charge, you would really expect them to be getting a few trophies in the bag. I mean, he got a trophy with David Luiz at the back, winning the FA Cup, with a bummy hang on ridiculous money for doing very, very little. And where's the guy now? He's in Marseille. You know, he went to Chelsea. He's not having the best of lives. He's had a bit of a downfall, if you like. He's gone from hitting the heights of his arsenal, from being a really great figure, really great name, a, a player that a lot of people looked up to. Went to Chelsea for the money. Sorry, to Barcelona for the money. Went to Chelsea to try and get a, pay, uh, a payday. And is now over in France as one of the marquee players. Manchester City are the only side not to lose in the last five games. However, who do you think is alongside that? Let me give you a few moments to guess. Manchester City, alongside another team, are the only side not to lose in their last five Premier League games. Have you got it? It's Brentford. Brentford and Thomas Frank's men. And Thomas Frank's also linked with the Liverpool job, which we'll go on to talk about in a short while. I mean, that's quite something. I mean, we're talking about Ivan Tony leaving, with Thomas Frank possibly even going, maybe leaving on his own terms, regardless if there's another job. I think he's really happy, but I think fans are starting to turn against him. When they first came into the Premier League, it was the Premier League boost. We saw them do really quite well and overachieve. I wouldn't say they're underachieving, but I do think they're doing not as great as what fans would have hoped for going into the season. But to be unbeaten in the Premier League in the last five games alongside a team with 115 FFP charges is really, really something to take up on the chin and they can really start boosting upon that. But as a side note, I think the season's gone really, really quick. I mean, one minute we saw Burnley play Manchester City, the next minute Burnley play Manchester City and are relegated. Well, we're probably going to see them get relegated alongside Sheffield United and the race, well, it got wide. So, so crucial last night with Everton beating Liverpool by two goals to nil at Goodison Park. We're now seeing probably a two-horse race with between who's going to get relegated, who's going to be that third team to go down, Luton or Nottingham Forest. You know, from from a Liverpool, a Liverpool fan's perspective, but I'm going to try and look at this from a neutral point of view. There's no hate between any of the clubs. I'd love to see Luton stay up due to their due to their story of getting very limited amounts of players, predicted to finish bottom, really small, great, tight knit community. But Nottingham Forest are a club that deserve to be in the Premier League. Let's be real. You know, they've won the Champions League, they've won, I think, league titles, they've won a whole host of things. However, after the break, we'll talk Liverpool versus Everton. Here's the blessed Madonna Madonna from FIFA. A song that is from FIFA and you FIFA fans must know that song all too well I would say it is probably the best song on the entire game I said it there you know we've seen in recent years the FIFA soundtracks I would say kind of deteriorated where they're not the big names anymore they're not Tom Grennan's they're not the big hitters that they used to be and it's more of a leveling ground for those maybe not so well known to get heard on such a great game or should I say EAFC 24, a game that I'm just not that good at, unfortunately. I'm trying to get better. I'm trying to improve. And ultimately, it just hasn't worked out. This year, the lifespan on my controller on FIFA has really, really not happened. I haven't played the game too much. Haven't really been too much of a belter this year. I suppose with, with external things, I've been focusing on other things elsewhere. And you could say even on the show, the brand new show here on Unite Radio, their football life with a whole host of topics to be talking about every other Thursday, 7 till 8 p.m. Now, let's talk about Everton versus Liverpool. As I told you before the break, I'm a Liverpool fan, but I try to do things here as as levelling as possible, as neutral as possible. Pretend I'm not a Liverpool fan. Well, <laughs> I suppose you can't really say that in this instance. Yesterday, I was going into this game thinking this wouldn't be too much of a problem. We've seen Everton struggle. We see that our derbies have been really, really great and really, really close in recent years. However, it's Everton. Everton haven't been too great this year. 
We lost to Crystal Palace 1 0 at Anfield. But I think what was more embarrassing is we lost to Atalanta 3 0 at Anfield, the home stadium, the fortress where we hadn't lost for over a year or around a year. And then we play West Ham with David Moyes' side, a side that's really hit the rocks recently. Hasn't really been too much of, um, what's it called, um, headline makers. I mean, obviously they won the Conference League, but you know, fans are starting to turn against um, David Moyes. I think that he's becoming quite unpopular with the fan base. I think they're absolutely crazy to think that. I think David Moyes has done a really great job. I think he's been a fantastic manager. And most importantly, I think he should sign the contract that was offered to him around Christmas time because he has a project building at West Ham. He, he West Ham fans... I think, need to take a look at themselves sometimes. They need to think about what life was like before David Moyes took charge. Where were they in the league? They were fighting relegation. There was unease. Mark Noble was their only notable player that was bringing them through the hard times with Dimitri Payet, who obviously left to go to France. But we look at this side now, and we see a team that we go into these games as Liverpool or as Manchester City or as even the teams lower down the table like Crystal Palace. It should be a, a, a win. But it should be a difficult win. Or oh, West Ham, you know, they're, they're starting to build. Ward Prowse is a really, really great name. Could even be on the plane for the Euros. And they're like, you know what? David Moyes got us this far. He won us our first trophy in God knows how long. But you know what? I want something a bit better. I want to try and finish in the top five and get Champions League. Oh, Champions League will be so good. No, you know what? Be grateful for what you have. You know, David Moyes consistently gets you into European competitions. Europa League. Europa League. The second best European competition. Stacked with history. You know, even if you might not be guaranteed to win these kind of tournaments because you're West Ham. I mean, you could say that about Liverpool and the, Conf and the Europa League. Guaranteed to win it in inverted speech marks. Didn't happen. But when you look at West Ham as players or as fans, it's the experiences that fans alike live for. Oh my gosh, we're going to play Leverkusen. We're going to go and play this team away. We're going to go to travel here. We're going to welcome Barcelona to our stadium. But is that not good enough? Because because five years ago, six years ago, before Moyes was there, all you fans were complaining that you were always struggling to survive in the Premier League. You're now more than surviving, and you're just not impressed. Speaking about former... Everton managers, David Moyes himself. The last time Liverpool lost at Goodison Park, Roy Hodgson was in charge. And David Moyes, the Everton manager. Two really prestigious names in our sport. And obviously, I wish Roy Hodgson well after he was taken ill and then left his post at Watford, a team that is quite close um, to my heart. I really have a great connection with Watford. Um, I must, you know, <laughs> A lot of the time I get called a fake fan, a plastic fan. But I think for all of us, if you want to extract the team that you support out of you, I think we're all football fans at the end of the day. You know, we support England. And look how communal we are when we support our country. I think I'm more within my right to go ahead and support Watford or Barnet or Liverpool or, you know, back Crystal Palace to beat this team or back so-and-so to beat so-and-so. I think it's really, really great to have such feasible options. And what I, but the only thing I don't like is obviously supporting rivals. But when you're supporting teams from different divisions and you have... And you have closer ties to lower league teams. You know, I, I've, I've taken pictures with Watford players or Barnet players. Never a Liverpool player. I mean, for obvious reasons. However, I think that is so good in the lower leagues to be so close to, to what could be the next generation of football. I mean, a lot of these Barnet players or Watford players aren't really at the highest of levels, understandably. But they could be. And that's what I think. That's why I love the, these lower divisions. Enough waffling about lower divisions. Liverpool yesterday had 77% possession. 77%. We play a controlled style of football. A side where we should be winning these games. And with 77% possession, if you're an alien, you just come down from an alienated world and you, and you explain to them what football is. Or even someone who doesn't have a clue about football. 77% is quite a number. And to lose 2-0, to not find the back of the net, is... Quite embarrassing. 23 shots. How many were on target? Seven. Seven shots for a team that we've spent years and years and years trying to build one of the best front threes or fours in the world. And we've, we've, we've just been destroyed by Everton. Everton Football Club with seven shots on target we've had yesterday. I mean, obviously, we saw great goals from Dominic Calvert-Lewin, who's been ridiculed with injuries. And also Branthway as well. I think he's a really, really great topic to speak about for the Euros. What England have is a really great back line. I think with Maguire, he's never put a really a foot wrong for England. John Stones and Branthway as well. Darwin Nunes, without a goal since the 4th of April. 
with a 3-1 win over Sheffield United. Liverpool fans have a really great connection to Darwin Nunes. And let me tell you why. Because we as a club, as any club, whether you're an Arsenal fan, a Barnet fan, a Watford fan, whatever club you may support, I think the most important thing is having a player on your team. For example, we spent, what was it, 70 million around for Darwin Nunes? 70 million pounds for Darwin Nunes. A player that never really doesn't turn up. He's always trying, always pressing for the ball. He's always working hard. You see it in his face. His is what I don't like from some of our players, including Nunes at times, is they can throw a tantrum or a strop or throw the arms. But to be fair, they've only got themselves to blame. Nunes, as I said, has failed to hit the back of the net since the 4th of April. And fans have really started to lose a bit of patience with him. He had a great opportunity in the first half when we were losing 1-0. Liverpool were losing 1-0. And pick, he hit it right at Pickford. He had the whole of the wide of, of the goal to A, Matt. Hit it right at Pickford. And I think what he lacks is composure. And sometimes he gets a bit carried away. I think we saw with um, with Nunes a few weeks ago where uh, he tried to chip it over the keeper and he completely missed the goal where really he could have gone round the goalkeeper and had that easier finish to score. But he doesn't think like that. He thought, you know, as Darwin Nunes here... I scored that similar goal against Brentford where he chipped it over Mark Flecken, a really great Dutch goalkeeper. But you can't really replicate those sorts of goals. They're great goals for a reason. They're praised for a reason. You don't see Tappins getting praised. You praised the goals that really, at times, shouldn't be scored or but scored by players like Darwin Nunes who are failing to hit the back of the net. Again, what I've seen with Liverpool recently is they're such a great club. I really, really think that the fans stick with them. And you see with some clubs, they leave early or they're a bit more toxic towards the fan base. However, with Klopp recently, I must say, from a Liverpool fan's perspective, he's got a lot of tactical errors wrong. We put pressure on ourselves. We were in all four competitions. We have now come out with an energy drink cup. We could win the Premier League. Is it likely? No. Are Arsenal favourites over Liverpool? Yes. Are City favourites over Arsenal? Yes. Are we going to win the Premier League? It could happen, but unlikely. So we could walk out on, quote-unquote, Klopp's final uh, farewell tour around all these Premier League grounds, all these trophies, to go ahead and win the Mickey Mouse Cup. We thought, oh my word, this could be a great thing. We've beaten Chelsea in the final. It's the first of a few cups that we can win. Van Dijk was crying. Virgil van Dijk, the captain of Liverpool Football Club, was crying when they won the Mickey Mouse Cup was crying, was emotional. Okay, fair play. You've worked really, really hard. But we still had so much to do before you even thought about crying. Cry when you win the Premier League, the Europa League. We were, we were miles, miles favourites to win the Europa League. We failed it to Atalanta. Atalanta, a team that won the Champions League a few years ago. But we're Liverpool Football Club. They should obviously be doing a lot better. By the way, guys, let me just catch you up. We've got half an hour left of this show, half an hour in. The show's not based on Liverpool whatsoever. We're currently talking about the Merseyside derby loss at the hands of Everton Football Club. More to come, including managerial chaos at Anfield. And then we'll also move on to the England squad and Southgate struggles, including a few snippets of interviews from an England international. That's all coming up in the next 29 minutes. Club's tactical errors. Last season, we saw when Liverpool failed to qualify for the Champions League. It was about six or seven games um, before the end of the season, we kind of knew that it wouldn't really happen. So Klopp started to change things up. He started to play a few players, maybe like Curtis Jones or Harvey Elliott, that we need to see a bit more of, especially from Harvey Elliott's case. Trent Alexander-Arnold was played in midfield on a regular basis, where he was relied on to be this decision-maker, quite similar to the role that Jude Bellingham would play in an England shirt or in Real Madrid, or even at Dortmund. And then we had, I think it was Joe Gomez at the time, flinging it right back. But Trent's been injured for the majority of this season. And we saw Connor Bradley, an, a quite inexperienced player. This guy, Connor Bradley, has been such a great addition to the Liverpool squad. Why is Klopp not playing him at right back and Trent in midfield? I don't get that decision making. I think we should play Gomez at left back. Because Robertson in recent weeks, and some people say he should be the captain. Some people say he should be one of, well, he is one of our best players. We talk about going past peaks. I think Robertson's reached his peak. He's dipped. He was a great player for about the last four or five years. I mean, we saw against Everton last night. He couldn't even get the ball. He had several crosses. He couldn't even get the ball over the first man 90% of the time. He's a Premier League football player. But regardless, he's Andrew Robertson. He's Andrew Robertson. This is where the, the problem comes with Liverpool. We rely on these players so much. And even with Trent yesterday, Trent's ability to cross the ball 
was shocking. It was so poor and quite a disgrace if you're paying your money to go and watch that shambles. Lastly, on Liverpool and on this um, calamity on 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 Wednesday night, Klopp stated he was out of energy before he um, before these games when he decided to come out and say he's going to step down at the end of the season. And obviously, this is to to come out and say this because he didn't want uh, press speculation, etc. He looks out of energy. These interviews that he's doing with BT Sports, with TNT, with Talk Sport, all these other news outlets, he's he's like. You know, yeah, we lost. You know, I want passion. And I think that's what a lot of fans want. And Klopp, really, we're now starting to see the deterioration of what was and what still is a great manager. But we're starting to see a deterioration in the man that's brought Liverpool fans so many. And I think he'll go out with his head held high, knowing that he's really turned our club around. But who would be the man to take on the reign and to move forward with such a great Liverpool team? Jabby Alonso. He decides to stay after winning the league unbeaten. He has eyes on the Real Madrid job, reportedly, when Carlo Angelotti goes, whether that be to Brazil, he was linked with that job, not going to happen now, I don't think. So when Angelotti decides enough's enough, two years down the line, Alonso's going to try and build on his portfolio and try and work a lot harder, not a lot harder, he's working wonders, but working in a sense where Real Madrid know that he's keeping an eye on them. He's in the final of the DFB Pokal Cup, the equivalent of the FA Cup probably a bit better than the Carroll Cup. He's in the final of that. He's in the Europa League semi-finals versus AC Roma, a side where De Rossi's taken over, done a really great job. However, this is where make or break for both sides. He's unbeaten in 45 games. Unbeaten. 115 charges, Manchester City. Couldn't quite do that. Liverpool can't do that. Arsenal can't do that. Chelsea can't do that. Manchester United can't do that. Real Madrid couldn't do that. Leverkusen. By a Leverkusen, a team, if three years ago, if you asked people, would you expect them to even get into the top four? No, no, you wouldn't. They've now won the league. Well, we're still speaking, unbeaten, unbeaten. It's insane. So, praise to Jabby Alonso. Shame he's not coming to Liverpool. But with managers that are as inexperienced as Alonso, it is, again, if I come to Liverpool, will I do as well? And then I might end up at Crystal Palace or a club that's maybe not as good. I mean, we could just say it like that. They're not as good as Liverpool or as well-known. Ruben Amorin was then the next contender. And every Liverpool fan was, okay, you know, we don't get Alonso, but surely, surely Ruben Amorin would like to come to us. He's he's top of the league by seven points. Seven points clear of Porto. This is a great statistic in itself, a number. Seven points clear of one of the biggest clubs in the world. They're in the final of... I think they're equivalent of the Carabao Cup, FA Cup, against Porto, which they obviously going to hope to win. However, when managers are speculating with jobs, as we spoke about at the start with the Serbi, of course they're going to come out and say, you know, it's not true, I haven't held an interview. And that's exactly what Amarin came out to say. He said there was no interview with any club, any club, meaning there could be more than one that he's linked to, and that's correct, West Ham as well. Ruben Amarin is an interesting one for me. I think he's still quite inexperienced. We're looking at quite inexperienced managers with Alonso and Amarim. Probably not going to happen now. However, the more experienced manager, Ar- Arne Slot, linked with Tottenham last year, talks broke down over certain instances and then you obviously got Postacoglu. They're second behind PSV with nine points. They won the league last season and they won the KNVB Cup, a really snazzy name for a cup. They won 1-0. And we really need to start thinking about managers for the long run. Everyone knows Liverpool aren't on a club to go ahead and sack managers in an instant. However, we should know by now that Liverpool are going to need a manager that knows what he's doing. I think inexperience in terms of Amarim, who's never really got too far in Europe, Slot has. I mean, he got knocked out by Roma in the Europa League, etc. But I think Slot will be the main man. I think you look at him and you think this guy can take us into certain areas. And there's no excuse not to because you've got Sabozloy, you've got McAllister, Trent, Kwanzaa, Gomez, Alisson, Salah, who's probably going to be going in the summer. Nunes, Jota, could he go? Could he stay? I mean, it's interesting because he's quite an injury-prone guy. However, look, we're looking at a really great team and there's no excuse not to do well. Another team with absolutely no excuse not to do well is England. When they go to Germany for Euro 2024, they play, they're going to play Serbia, Denmark and Slovenia all in one one leg games, there's no home or away, they just play them once in Germany, a game with a lot of speculation around these sides where we should be smashing them, possibly even three clean sheets, three out of three, we saw with Denmark in Euro 2020 at Wembley, where England hadn't conceded until the semi-finals, I believe it was, when we played Denmark and Damsgaard uh, scored a great free kick, England though have been really, really poor in recent games, they drew to Belgium, 
2-2 in a game, again, probably should have won. And then a 1-0 loss to Brazil at Wembley with a goal from Enric. A game where we, England fans can get a bit carried away, myself included. And, we, you know, we say to ourselves, we're in a really great position. We should really go into this tournament with a head held high, expecting to go ahead and do really, really well. Automatically, yes. But we've now gone ahead and played two good teams in Belgium and Brazil. And we've really struggled. We've not won. We haven't beat... Obviously, Brazil aren't going to be in Germany because they're not European. However, they're a great team. They're arguably the second or first best team in the world and we struggle to beat them. If we want to be the best team in the Europe, in Europe, as a, uh, <laughs> instead of the World Cup, we need to step up and beat the likes of France and, uh, and Belgium. 2-2 two is not good enough. Our golden generation, Saka, Foden, Trent... Pickford, I mean, he's a great goalie, isn't he? We've got a great team building here, and I really think that we have no excuse not to do well building up to the Euros. Southgate struggles in a lot of these big games is what a lot of people are having on their lips, and a lot of people are joking, saying Southgate should be going. No way, Southgate can't be going um, with about 50 days until this major tournament. But what we need to look at from an England perspective is England versus the top 10 rivals to win Euro 2024. France, with 69.6% win, uh, win percentage, a big drop this is. Spain second, with 42.9%. That is some stat in between. Belgium, 35.3%. And England, just around 30% when they play the top 10 rivals to win Euro 2024, 30% of the time they win. 30%, not good enough. But they're better than Italy, Portugal, the Netherlands, Germany and Croatia. If we're going to look at percentages. But it's just about turning up. And obviously Germany on home soil is not going to be a joke. We know how good Germany are. Um, and I think England can struggle at times. I think we're going to get to the quarters as a guarantee. Anything but then. I mean, anything but then. There needs to be some serious po uh, fingers pointed towards Southgate. I think he's done a great job. I think this will be his last tournament. Without a doubt. We're going to look at players now. You know, outside choices. Where they're unlikely to be called up. But... Some could argue that they could be called up. Rico Lewis, really, really fond of him. I think he's done a great job. He can play left back, right back, centre back, CDM, possibly even midfielder at times. Too injury prone for me. I think this year he hasn't really been the man that he was last. Uh, he's struggled in recent times, as I said, injuries, um, which doesn't help a young player trying to build into a great Manchester City squad. They can do without him. They can really do without him. They've got De Bruyne. They've got Rodri. They've got Kovacic. They've got Calvin Phillips, who's obviously out on loan at West Ham. But they've got a really great team, and they can do without Rico Lewis. Rico Lewis is no big loss. Raza, Raheem Sterling, a man that would, on paper, be the biggest player at Chelsea Football Club in terms of names and in terms of reputation. He's always been... He hasn't really been bad in an English show. He's always been quite reliable. Um, but... No one's going to be calling you up if you're playing badly for your club. If you're injury prone, if you're talking badly against your club, no one's going to be calling you up. So, I don't think Sterling or Rico Lewis should be called up. Now, a man that should be called up, Dominic Solanke. Dominic Solanke, 100% should go. Over Rashford, the only problem is with that, stating over Rashford. Rashford can play left wing, cam, striker, right wing, centre mid. He can play in a lot of positions, whereas Solanke can only play up front. However, Solanke has never put a foot wrong, really. He's never said anything bad about clubs, never goes to clubs, okay? Never in terms of partying and going out on nights in Belfast, which is what Marcus Rashford likes to be doing. And his excuse is he's young and he's trying to experience life. However, really, Rashford, you've got Euros and England to be thinking about. Reese James, Levi Cowell, injury prone, two injury prone, not, any, not even in the conversation. After a goal yesterday, Branthway, he's a solid centre-back choice. Only negative about him, he can't be shifting into, into CDM. He's just a centre-back. Nothing more, nothing less. But a really solid, tall choice. The, you know, the training squad will be announced on the 21st of May. That's the training squad. I think three or four players will have to be removed from that training squad. So Southgate will look at this team and say, I want these players, I want these removed. And so forth. An unreleased interview with Thomas Atkinson who is the England amplitude goalkeeper going to Euro 2024 this summer, playing in Euro 2024. He won the Nations League, the first, well, <laughs> apart from the Lionesses, who else has won uh, as an England team a major trophy? No one, not the men's team, just the Lionesses and this great team. And this is what it's like, the feeling of being called up to an England camp, something that a very, very small percentage of players get. Thomas has experienced it, and this is what he had to say about being called up to the England squad 
and the England camp. You know, when you see it on TV with the men's team, Saka came, they all turn up in the, in the cars and they're all there. What is that like to be able to do that in person? Yeah, I, it, it's a it's a real honour. And I think it's something that I've kind of brushed apart past in my career club, I've done it so many times where it's like training camps or like going from like international duty. Uh, and it's something that I, I think I really need to like, like understand a bit further. Mm-hmm. The fact I'm, I'm constantly getting called up for England. I'm constantly going back to these programs that uh, are showing that I'm the best in the country. Um, and I think it's really something that I think everyone could uh, take a great honour in, whether it's Saka, Kane, myself, uh, Jamie, uh, the England setup. I think everyone understands it. You're doing this because you're the best, um, and I think it's something that you've got to take. And I'm very like uh, I take a lot of national prize, uh, and the fact that I'm representing England on a, a global scale now um, is something that I'm very very proud of. As it should be, Thomas. That's a really really great achievement to be called up to represent your country. A thing that not a lot of people would be doing. I think a lot of people obviously would like to be doing it. Of course, represent your country. Nothing is better than doing that. He's playing, as I said, in Euro 2024 this summer. He is playing with the likes of France. In France, sorry. He's playing against Italy, Georgia and the Netherlands. He also spoke about the difficulty of being drawn into this group. He is from Carlisle and as I said, he's facing off Italy, Georgia and the Netherlands and he spoke about the difficulties of being in such a difficult pot. Looking into the Euros this summer in France, I mean, the men's team are playing, is it around the same time I think it is as well? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's going to be a great summer. Hopefully both teams can win it. But I mean, <laughs> Southgate at the wheel, we're not quite sure. But with you lot, you mentioned that Italy, Georgia and the Netherlands are all in one group. I mean, what you've said is a very difficult group. And you're, you're probably going to say yes. Where would you want to finish? Would it be top? Yeah, absolutely. I'd absolutely say we're, say we're the best team of that group. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously, you've got to give respect to these opponents. Um, we've done it in the past where we've just written people off um, and thought, oh, we've beat them in the past or we beat them two years ago comfortably, we can just do it again, um, which we don't want to get into the mindset of before a tournament. Um, and I think we've drawn, been drawn to the most, uh, the worst pot possible, as it's a bit of a group of death. You've got the best team in pot four, the best team in pot three, the best team in pot two, and as England were the best team in pot one. Um, so you could say you could definitely, could have had an easier draw, but I, I personally, and I've, I think as a, a whole setup, I, I like going through the, the harder draws, as in you, you don't need to go through the motions of a tournament, playing loads of easy teams, and then get drawn into a, a very hard quarterfinal, um, which I think is very lucky. Um, so we can get into that groove early early doors in the tournament, and we can play against some hard teams, we can have them challenges, we can go through the ups and downs very early, and that allows us to go, then go into our groove throughout the tournament, which is something that I think will really benefit us in the long run, and people might say to oh, it, He's going to get knackered in the early doors. You might get a few upsets early doors, but I think it'll it'll really allow us to play our game further in the tournament. We'll be playing with that free football that we can play, um, and I think our our group setup is going to allow us to go progress further into the tournament. And... You know, absolutely. I think that's a really really great analysis from Thomas. There, I think. It's a really great thing to be going ahead to go, go play against such great teams in the hopes of playing against these great teams. It's something that everyone wants to do. I think if you want to look at it from a player's perspective, I think that players are really, really lucky and privileged to be able to go and play against such great teams. Moving topics, just a tad. The lineups for Manchester City versus Brighton at the Amex Stadium tonight. It's a 4 2 3 1 for Brighton. Uh, Steele is in goal with Veltman, Van Heck, Lewis Dunk, and Barco in the back four. Pascal Grob alongside Cuomo Belba in midfield with Adam Lana, Modere and Joao Pedro as the three behind the main man, former Manchester United player Danny Welbeck. For Manchester City, it's a weird one. It's a 3-2-4-1. Edison returns in between the sticks with Guardiola. Nathan Ake and Kyle Walker as the centre-back three. Mikel Akanji, is it Akanji? I don't know what the first name is. Akanji and Rodri are in holding midfield with Phil Foden, Kovacic, De Bruyne, Silva, and of course, Julian Alvarez up front. You know what? That is a team that is out for business. They've got four players behind the lone striker to give him plenty of support, plenty of possession, and probably plenty of goals. I think that's going to be an absolute thriller of a game. As I said, 8pm that kicks off. Um, and that'll be a really great game. Uh, Watford face off in this weekend versus Sunderland. Where do I go with this one? Recently, Watford have been in the headlines once again because they sacked another manager. Valerian Ismail was a great manager, a great manager, great manager, I said that to us, great guy. 
And what I think with Watford they lack is the brains behind <laughs> some sort of business deals or whatever they do. But to sack managers constantly, you know, we've all seen, we've all seen the, the statistic which, you know, Watford managers last about seven months before they get sacked. Look at Edwards at, at Luton Town. He was former Watford manager. What did he do at Watford? Not a lot. Is he making headlines at Luton? Yes. Would you rather manage in the Premier League or in the EFL Championship? Probably in the Championship and also win the playoff final. So Watford... I think they get a bit too ahead of themselves sometimes. I think they expect them to be in the Premier League, but really they are probably below the table club in the Championship. Tom Cleverley got put in charge of interim boss after Ismail was sacked in a really weird time of the season. Five out of the seven teams faced in his first seven games in charge were in the top seven, only losing one. But this is where my problem comes in. He only won one. He drew five games. Five games. And the limitation of goals scored is quite embarrassing. I don't know the exact statistic, but it's not a lot. Um, and you look at um, Rashevich up front, or you look at Hernandez, or you look at some good players that Watford have got on their team. Obviously not world class, obviously not even great players, but decent players for the championship. But what I see with Watford is a team that don't want to be there. I think a lot of the players in that team, you know, know that another manager is going to be around the corner, know that they that they can still get a wage and be there for another two years because they're under contract. And the ones that want to be there get sold. I mean, Ben Foster obviously is a really great name, older, but he gets get rid of to Wrexham or they didn't renew his contract. You see it with uh, Pedro, a great player that they got rid of, obviously for obvious reasons, but they don't replace them. And they expect these players that are nowhere near as good or will never be as good as some of these players. And they expect them to do just as well. Not going to happen. However, We've got 10 minutes left on my show here on Unite Radio, a brand new show. And you can catch up my other show, a show that will be celebrating its two-year anniversary later on this year. Kick off with Jamie McCready. I think it's quite a well-known show now, guys. Come on, we all know the drill. Uh, seven, Not 7 till 8 p.m. That's this show today. 5 till 6 p.m. every single Wednesday. An interview with the one lonely Matteo speaking about Grande Torino. To be, to be honest, a really sad story. And let me just sum it up for you with just a tad. Uh, Matteo's got so much more 5 till 6 p.m. on Wednesday on here on Unite Radio. Grande Torino was uh, uh, the Torino team. They were travelling back from a game. Um, and basically the, the plane crashed killing all the players and it was such a great squad of players a lot of those players were in the Italian national team and unfortunately none of them or a very small amount of them survived he's got all of that coming up 5 to 6pm alongside myself uh, we're talking all sorts Italy as well the following week we've got Callum Pitt a man who is really interesting playing in the Scottish divisions in a high level in the championship in Scotland for Edinburgh City uh, looking to break into the Scottish national team but also spoke about the struggles of having dyslexia and having ADHD in an upbringing where football is just the main focus of his life. After the break, I'll be talking even more about the world of football and what's coming up here on Unite Radio. But here- what a great song that is by Marshmallow. And of course, so much more is coming up here on Unite Radio and of course on my social media channels. Jamie.McCready, M C C R E E D Y, for loads more content. And also, let me just add what an absolute insane, diverse. Um, polling we had earlier on today. I did a post on Instagram asking all of you what um, your opinion was on this quote from Jamie Carragher. Canate has been so poor. Liverpool need to buy a centre-back in the summer. And I asked on my Instagram poll, is Kwanzaa a better, more consistent player than Ibrahim Canate? 44% of you said yes. 56% of you said no. That is quite something. I mean, that's quite a big divide. 44% said yes. So there's a lot of the fan base that believe that, um, you know, a lot of the fan base believe that Kwanzaa is maybe a bit better than uh, Ibrahim Kanate that we brought in to to really uh, strengthen that back line alongside Virgil van Dijk. Now, a bit more about what I'm doing this weekend. It's a bit of a footballing weekend for myself. Barnet. I'm heading down to Barnet to watch Idris Kanu. Of course, the main man. You know, I interviewed him in the past. Go and check the YouTube channel out. Jamie.McCready, M-C-C-R-E-E-D-Y. With the full interview, if you go into the live section, it was a live stream. Um... Well, we've got loads of people talking. And of course, on TikTok as well, it's the same, jamie.mccreedy, where he posted his FIFA card rating and it got it got a bit of controversy uh, where people were quite torn to not understand how good of a player he is. Anyway, I'm heading down to Barnet this weekend to go and watch him. I think that'll be a really, really great game. Um, and you know what? If they win, they head off to Wembley to go ahead and play in the playoff final for a chance in League 2 next season. 
There's no reason as to why Barnet aren't favourites. They finished um, the top place where they didn't get promoted. They finished second. Um, so really, there is no reason why Barnet shouldn't win on paper. Um, however, we've got to look at realism and think it's a big game for both sides. Both sides are going to be under pressure from minute dot. Um, and But it's one legged as well. It's called a semi final, but they're both one. Uh, it's one legged. Um, so whoever wins um, this weekend, seven, not 7 30, 5 30 pm, will be decided to go to Wembley. And then Wembley will decide who is the newest addition to League Two next season. It's been a while since Barnett have been in League Two. Uh, it'd be nice to see it because they've got a really great team. Believe me, they pass the ball like Prime Barcelona. A really, really great team of passing. A young team, a team that are playing, some of them like Idris Kanu are playing on the international stage. However, that's enough from me. What about, what about this song, Until I Found You by Stefan Sanchez? Mm-hmm. 